The intent of this video is to discuss the impact that German flat guns had on U.S. bombers and bomber crew members during World War II. Bombers flying over Nazi-occupied Europe were engaged by German fighters and flak. The Germans employed various caliber and sighting system anti-aircraft artillery to combat the U.S. and British heavy bombers. The purpose of flak is to reduce the bomber's airframe structural integrity, damaging or destroying the plane's vital systems, and wounding or killing bomber crew members. This April 1945 chart indicates characteristics of heavy, medium, and light flak. Light and medium flak was not effective at higher altitudes. Since heavy bombers operated at high altitudes over Nazi-occupied Europe, heavy flak was the most significant type of anti-aircraft threat. Heavy anti-aircraft guns are defined by an artillery projectile diameter at 75 millimeters or greater. The projectiles are fired at 10 to 15 rounds per minute and would employ a time fuse which would trigger the projectile's detonation train. This chart shows the various German light and heavy anti-aircraft guns. The first column is the gun, as defined by its projectile diameter in millimeters. The top row are various parameters of each of the guns. The German 88mm gun represented 65% of all anti-aircraft heavy artillery batteries and will be the focus of this presentation. Couple characteristics of the 88mm flat gun and cartridge. There were various models of the 88mm gun. The most common were the early flak 88 18 36, 37, and the later 41 models. The model designation indicates the year the gun was standardized. For example, the FLAC 88-37 model was standardized in 1937. The complete round weighed 31.7 pounds. The projectile weighed 20.35 pounds and contained 1.9 pounds of an explosive fill. That's 15 times the explosive fill of a World War II pineapple hand grenade. The shell contained 5.03 pounds of a propellant. The typical projectile fuse was detonated by a timer, up to 30 seconds. The projectile did not detonate by barometric pressure or proximity triggers. The practical rate of fire equated to 12 to 15 rounds per minute as defined by this 1945 declassified document. Muzzle velocity equated to 2,735 feet per second or Mach 2.45. The shell was manually loaded into the gun after the fuse was set by a timer instrument. This chart shows the cutaway of the 88 millimeter time fuse and the fuse time setter. The effective ranges of various German anti-aircraft guns are shown in this chart. The 88 millimeter projectile's effective ceiling equated to 26,000 feet for continuously pointed fire. Continuously pointed fire was considered the most accurate and deadly. The Germans tracked the bombers by optical range fighters and radar. The position of the bombers were fed into a computer which, in turn, provided a ballistic solution to the gun batteries. The lethal detonation range varied by the type of gun. This July 1945 declassified intelligence report defines the lethal distance from flak projectiles. The lethal range of an 88 millimeter projectile is 4 meters or 13 feet. This chart shows the lethal radius of an 88 millimeter projectile in reference to the size of a B-17 bomber. The number of flak projectiles needed to destroy a bomber vary depending on the source. The value is likely between 1,000 and 4,000. The actual number is dependent on the gun caliber, type of projectile, height and speed of the formation, flak battery sighting and tracking system, formation size, formation saturation tactics, and if anti-flak countermeasures were employed. A captured German flak officer indicated it would take 1,600 88 millimeter cannon rounds to bring down a B-17 bomber flying at 20,000 feet. The results of his interrogation are documented in this declassified 1945 report. 
Bomber crews would report the flak experience by three parameters. This June 1945 chart describes the flak reporting values. The first parameter was the type of fire. This is based on the caliber of the flak gun as either light, medium, or heavy. Since the majority of bombers operated at altitudes beyond the light and medium caliber anti-aircraft fire, this first parameter would most likely be heavy. The second flak parameter is the intensity of the flak. This is based on the time duration between flak projectile detonations. Intense flak is defined as over 5 projectile bursts per second. Moderate flak is defined as 2 to 5 projectile bursts per second. And meager flak is defined as less than 2 flak bursts per second. The third parameter is the accuracy of the flak. If the plane is hit or rocked, then the flak is considered accurate. If the flak bursts are beyond the danger area, the flak is considered inaccurate. This January 1945 high altitude B-29 after mission report defines the flaks encountered as heavy guns, flak intensity was meager to moderate, and flak accuracy was accurate to inaccurate. Bombing was conducted at an altitude around 26,000 feet. This March 1945 B-29 low-altitude firebomb after mission report defines the flak encountered as medium to heavy guns, flak intensity was meager to moderate, and flak accuracy was accurate to inaccurate. Bombing was conducted at an altitude around 7,000 feet. So just how significant was flak on bomber crews and planes, and what could be done to eliminate or reduce the flak threat? In the early period of the war, ground artillery flak was responsible for 40% of returning bomber crew member wounds, as shown in this table, for the period of November 1942 through December 1943. Fighters were more of a threat than flak during this period. Bomber Command issued bomber crew members flak vests, aprons, and helmets. Crew flak armor was credited with reducing wounds by 60%. This chart shows a distribution of threats heavy bombers faced over Nazi-occupied Europe in World War II. The x-axis is a month and year from June 1942 to May 1945. The y-axis is the number of bombers destroyed per month. The bombers were deployed by either the 8th or 15th U.S. Army Air Forces out operating out of Great Britain and Italy respectively. The data is also represented by B-17 and B-24 bombers. The area in the charts indicate the number of bombers destroyed per month by either ground artillery flak, fighters, or other. Bombers destroyed by other include mid-air collisions, ground accidents, pilot error, and such occurring during combat missions. The tabular data and data source is included. A couple trends in the data we're discussing. The data shows that overall, more bombers were destroyed by flak than fighters. Of the 8,314 B-17s and B-24s destroyed over Nazi-occupied Europe on combat missions, 45% were destroyed by flak, 40% by fighters, and 15% by other. The data also shows that more bombers were destroyed by fighters than flak up to May 1944. After May 1944, more bombers were destroyed by flak than fighters. There are many factors which contributed to the shift in threat from fighters to flak. The chief causes were the availability of long-range fighter escort, deeper penetration missions during 1944, reduction in German fighter combat efficiency, aviation fuel shortages, stepped-up blind bombing, and German redeployment and concentration of flak batteries. This chart shows the land area controlled by the Reich in January 1945. Flak guns were redeployed from previously occupied territories and concentrated to protect vital German industries and urban areas. This chart outlines the distances to targets that the 8th Army Air Forces bombed from July 1943 to August 1944. The months are represented by wedges. The dots are targets bombed. The radial distance from the center of the pie to the target is shown graphically. Deep penetration bombing was halted after the disastrous Schweinfurt II Barbering bombing mission of October 1944. Deep penetration bombing was restarted during Operation Argument, or known as Big Week, in February of 1944 and continued aggressively throughout the rest of the war. 
Let's take a detailed look at the impact FLAC had on the 8th Army Air Force's heavy bombers from data snippet spanning January 1944 through May 1944. The data will strongly reflect the B-17 bomber rather than the B-24 bomber as the 8th Army Air Force's fleet mainly consisted of B-17s. This chart reflects the distribution of B-17s and B-24s for the 8th and 15th U.S. Army Air Forces. On average, 71% of the 8th Army Air Force's operational fleet was represented by B-17s during this period. This chart shows the causes of bomber damage for the time period of January 1944 through May 1944. Of the eight U.S. Army Air Force's returning bombers, FLAC was responsible for 84 percent of the 15,008 incidents of damage. This September 1945 declassified document details the 8th Army Air Force's flak bomber damage and losses during January 1944 through May 1944. A visual representation of the data is presented for ease of understanding. Of the 59,148 credited sorties flown, 12,600 bombers were hit by flak. 600 of the 12,600 bombers were destroyed by flak, while 12,000 bombers continued back to base with flak damage. 400 of the 600 bombers that were destroyed by flak were over the target. 200 of the 600 bombers that were destroyed by flak went en route towards or away from the target. Note that over the target is defined as the leg from the initial point, or IP, to the rally point, or RP, as shown in this graphic. Takeaways from this data include, bombers had a 21% chance of being hit by flak during accredited sortie. Roughly 1 in 20 bombers hit by flak would be destroyed. Two-thirds of all bombers destroyed by flak occurred while over the target. The report went on to say, flak hits to and from the target can be avoided completely if flying to and from the target in flak-free zones. 25% of flak hits can be avoided if the navigator and bombardier strictly followed attack and withdrawal paths as determined by a flak analysis. Bomber Command Flak Intelligence Team would assess the flak threat. A flak analysis would recommend the best course to avoid flak to and from the target and best approaches during and after the bomb run. This chart shows the location of bombing targets through June 1944. This September 1945 document shows the flak concentrations over Nazi-occupied Europe during September 1943 and again in February 1945. This chart shows the locations of 14,560 heavy flak anti-aircraft guns. This chart shows a route that avoids the flak. During the pre-flight briefing, the navigator and bombardier will have been provided the results of a detailed flak analysis. The analysis will show the best route to minimize flak exposure. The flak analysis starts by graphically representing flak battery positions relative to the target. Each gun's effective vertical and slant range will be known. This map shows the positions of heavy anti-aircraft guns relative to a target. Overlapping gun densities are graphically represented. Based on this data, the flak analyst will provide the best in and best out solution while over the target. This is the route the formation should follow to minimize flak exposure. This chart shows the location of heavy flak batteries at Munich, Germany in January 1944 for reference. There are additional steps to reduce the susceptibility of flak. This July 1945 intelligence report outlines lessons learned from the European theater. The reports state that flak can be completely evaded by either flying over the gun's effective range or flying around the gun staying outside of their range. Flak accuracy decreases 50% for every 5,000 foot altitude gain above 15,000 feet. Bombing accuracy decreases roughly 3% for every 1,000-foot altitude gain. Bomber Command needs to weigh bombing accuracy versus anticipated flak losses in establishing bombing altitudes. Another rule of thumb is that flak projectile will gain 1,000 foot in altitude every second. It will take 25 seconds for the flak projectile to reach a bomber traveling at a 25,000 foot altitude. 
The anti-aircraft gunner will not aim at the bomber, but will need to predict the bomber's location in 25 seconds and aim at that point in 3D space. This is where the bomber may take evasive action to throw off the gunner's prediction. Evasive action cannot be taken over the target though. This July 1945 intelligence report outlines six rules to follow to minimize the flak threat. This includes Fly at an altitude which minimizes flak risk but provides acceptable bombing accuracy. Follow the path as outlined by a flak analysis. Saturate the enemy defenses. Decrease formation trail distances. This rule was found to be most effective in minimizing the flak threat by decreasing the formation's following duration from 2.6 minutes to 12 seconds. Flak losses decreased by 88%. Fly two formations abreast to minimize the time over the target and saturate the defenses. Change tactics to confuse ground gunners. This 1945 declassified document outlines additional steps to minimize the flak threat. This includes take evasive action. Evasive action cannot occur during the bombing run and is not effective during barrage firing. Reduce the formation size. This will reduce the anti-aircraft gunner's target size. Better flak intelligence, better navigation, better crew and plane armor, radar countermeasures and jamming, like dropping window or shaft. This is a typical German anti-aircraft radar site. The, this British bomber is dropping radar countermeasures, window or shaft, which is essentially tinfoil. Another factor which reduced the flak and also fighter threat was blind bombing. Blind bombing occurred when weather conditions prevented visual bombing. If the cloud cover was greater than 5 tenths, the target would be tracked, sighted, and bombed with radar. This also implies that ground anti-aircraft fire would need to be directed by radar. German-directed anti-aircraft radar fire is less accurate than optically-directed anti-aircraft fire. This March 1946 report snippet indicated that bomber losses due to enemy fighters were reduced by two-thirds and bomber flak was considerably less during blind bombing missions. This chart shows the distribution of bombs that were released by visual and radar sighting methods. More tonnage of bombs were released by radar than visual sighting methods. Radar was available for bomb sighting in September 1943. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider liking, commenting, or subscribing to the channel, World War II U.S. Bombers.